Cowboy Bebop is one of the most unique television shows ever created. Often cited as one of the best anime shows of all time, the show earns a lot of its identity from its blending of various elements, from westerns, sci-fis, and film noirs, into a cohesive and stylish package. Where the cowboy in Cowboy Bebop is an obvious nod to the old American West, the second half of the show's title, Bebop, refers to the name of the spacecraft inhabited by the protagonists. The ship is used by these bounty hunters as they hop from planet to planet and chase bounty after bounty, and this indicates the show's futuristic setting, as the existence of such transportation would be impossible if set in the present day. The bebop is a rather important tool in the story, as it not only comes in handy in a few hairy encounters, but it also plants the protagonists in the locations of importance for each episode. Though the fictional spacecraft indicates a substantial evolution in technology and science, the show's locations, conflicts, and people betray whatever progressive and evolved world was implied by the bebop. Take a look. Do I really look like I have money? Why not? All foreigners are rich! Surprisingly, the bustling hotspots in the show are more or less what you can find in today's reality. For all of the technological innovations present in the existence of the bebop, the urban centers of the show are really no different than a lot of contemporary cities, like, say, New York. Just like the urban centers of today and decades ago, the settings in Cowboy Bebop are rife with drugs, crime, gang influence, destitution, and the like. Moreover, the choice weapons for these mafiosos are old, accessible 20th century weaponry, as opposed to the high-tech armaments found in other science fiction media. In Blade Runner, the protagonist, Rick Deckard, carries around a laser tube, as it's dubbed in the novel, and though it fires conventional ammunition in the film, its flashy exterior design is clearly meant to suggest the high-tech capabilities of its cyberpunk world. There's also the laser and plasma weaponry found in the Fallout video game series, which seems most fitting for a sci-fi entertainment property. By contrast, the guns brandished by the street prowlers and the crew of the Bebop are basic pistols, which fire typical ammunition. Their designs are conventional and basic, offering nothing of particular interest or unique value. And they don't cause an almost comical whole-body incineration, just dirty, bloody bullet wounds. Of all the show's smaller details, this one contributes more to the dilapidated feel than perhaps any other. Huh? Though there is an undeniable grime permeating the streets of the show's city centers, there's certainly a cleanliness to be found elsewhere. Funnily enough, perhaps the most polished and pristine location in the entire show is a satellite dedicated solely to gambling. This place much more closely resembles what one would envision in a futurist world. It emits a potent fluorescence, beckoning to all passersby to stop in and indulge in a bit of wagering, filling the deep pockets of the casino in the process. At this point in the show, it becomes quite clear that in expanding humanity's reach beyond Earth and outward towards the vast expanses of the universe, we didn't quite end the deplorable practices of the past, we just exported it. As it turns out, newfangled tech and improvements in medicine can't eliminate the universal human struggle. No wounds left and the cells are dividing quite nicely. So you only have one problem left and you know what that is, huh? Coming up with 30 million wulongs for the basic operation in addition to 54 years of interest payments. In a world as filled with greed, vice, crime, and corruption as that of Cowboy Bebop, no one can be fully held accountable for their shortcomings. In fact, the show makes a point of characterizing each antagonist as being a victim of the regrettably sinful climate. The advancements, whether technological or medical, serve only to aid the powerful in their pursuit of money, or in their pursuit of some grand discovery or achievement, no matter how depraved the road there is. Though very much a neo-noir, sci-fi, western anime, Cowboy Bebop is most certainly a cyberpunk as well. Although it's not rain-coated and neon-lit like Blade Runner, the show similarly presents dilapidation and degradation within a world boasting flying ships and interplanetary travel. At every turn, there is a poor, lost soul who's received none of the benefits from this future society, yet bore all of its weights. They say he appears with a smile, 
and he leaves with a smile. In one episode, a psychotic killer going by the moniker Mad Piero hunts down Spike relentlessly, nearly killing him in the process. He's described to be the perfect killing machine, yet is plagued with the infantile mind of a child. After an arduous confrontation with the maniac, Spike finally manages to land a hit and chuck a knife into his leg, leaving the bonkers Frenchman to start bawling like a baby. It was disclosed earlier in the episode that he was the sorry victim of a highly experimental, though ultimately scrapped, scientific endeavor. The work done on him by the professionals left his mind scarred, and the trauma not only stunted his mental faculties, but regressed them to that of a child. Yet he remained endowed with superhuman capabilities, and the combination of the two elements bore the giggling slaughterhouse of a man seen on screen. Ultimately, he had the mind of a child, and it was the caprice of a reckless adolescent which drove his murders. He was also much more fragile than he let on, similarly like a child. Seeing him break down in his final moments invokes a sort of sadness, as he, like practically everybody in the show, fell prey to the sick enterprise of others, reaped the rotten fruits of the world he was born into. As an audience, we don't despise him the way we might any conventional antagonist, but we pity him. He wasn't born evil. He was handed an insurmountable weight. Apparently, his mind is continuing to regress. So he's like a child with superhuman combat capabilities. And really, there's nothing more pure and cruel as a child. Though Mad Piero is a more extreme case, and most antagonists aren't as deeply troubled as he, where his severely addled brain simply geared him towards vicious killing, the small fries of the show tend to willingly engage in criminality out of a desperation. In the show's very first episode, we're shown just how necessary unlawful enterprises are. In pursuit of a drug dealer named Asimov, who sells a rage-inducing product known as Bloody Eye, Spike runs into the man's wife. In slyly conversing with her, he's able to squeeze out a bit of useful information, yet one peculiar lead requires no talking at all. By merely glancing at the woman, Spike notices her bulging stomach, indicating a pregnancy. The fact holds some significance, as it creates some sympathy for the woman. At the very least, the viewer can understand her reasoning for staying in crime with her husband. Perhaps she's considered how the lucrative nature of the trade could provide substantial aid in raising the child. Yet when she's later shot in the stomach, we simply see her dress rip and a heap of the bloody eyed drug spills out, revealing that she was never pregnant in the first place. Symbolically, this tells the audience two things. First, in this world, child rearing has taken a back seat to crime. This place is growing discord and nourishing decay, not fostering a new generation of life. Second, criminality is simply more feasible than procreation, or most other work for that matter. Even on their perfectly legal, bounty hunting income, Spike and Jet still find themselves going hungry for days at a time, so it's no surprise to find some destitution among the general public. As we'll learn from Jet's ex-partner at the ISSP, even the police force, the people sworn to fend off seedy activity, ends up selling out to influential gangs, known as syndicates, due to the indelible sway that these mafias of sorts hold over society as a whole, and the undeniable payoffs that they offer. You brought it on yourself, partner. You just couldn't play the game like everybody else. But people who go against the syndicate lose, Jet. They lose big. Nobody's finances are all too pretty, and the show makes a frequent point of depicting average, decent members of society stooping to engage in a little bit of shady business out of a sheer desperation. In an episode where Jet visits its home satellite, we get to see him touch base with an old lady friend of his. We find out that she isn't doing so well financially, and later we also learn that she got into some hot waters with a sleazy loan shark. The satellite as a whole is said to have undergone a nasty recession, leaving average workers like her without much income, and she even makes a point of mentioning her decrease in customers at the bar she operates. Stricken by tight finances, she'd made a desperation move, deciding to borrow money from some street hoodlums as a way to help pay off her mortgage. With bankers who aren't too understanding, as Jet put it, she was placed in a tough spot. Her plan ultimately resulted in her boyfriend getting entangled, committing homicide and self-defense in the process. Though it backfired horribly, she can't be blamed too harshly, since she wasn't exactly left with too many other options. Since the recession hit, I hear she's got a lot of debts to pay off. 
Well, I'm sure it's not easy for a woman living alone trying to keep body and soul together. You know how it is. If Jet's lady friend dipped into the criminal world in order to merely stay afloat, then Asimov's wife did so just to get away from it all. Back to the first episode, Asimov's wife reveals to Spike that she hopes to immigrate to Mars, where she believes that there's a better life to be found. Her husband may be a bit unhinged beyond reasoning, but she ultimately has dreams beyond their life of crime. No one can truly bash such an aspiration, and so when she kills her husband and then herself, there's no real feeling of victory or triumph. Spike himself seems lost in contemplative thought after the whole ordeal, and though it could simply be a disappointment with the foregoing of the bounty price on Asimov, a recurrent trend in the show, there's likely a few other thoughts going through his head. After all, who doesn't want to go to Mars? Even in its wide-ranging cast of side characters and antagonists, Cowboy Bebop retains a through-line connecting them all. From a French madman resembling the Penguin from Batman, to a struggling barkeep, and to the wife of an amped-up drug dealer, they all carry a weight imposed on them by this world. For a show which takes place off of Earth, for the most part, it feels immensely grounded in this theme. No matter where humanity expands its reach, there will be injustice and there will be abuse, Thus, there are victims in every corner. That's not to defend a defeatist mindset, nor to propose succumbing to the weight of victimhood, but it is to say that a little bit of empathy is due to all, from those with the cleanest noses to the most vile of perpetrators. <laughs> 